this series that we started back a couple weeks ago entitled For the Glory of One. And the reality is, is that our lives were created for the glory of one. Knowing that fact, we can also be aware and look and realize that we're living in contentious times and the times that we're living in. And it's exciting. Well, that would have been a great place for amen. Okay, well, at least you let me know where your faith is at this morning. So now I'm going to have to work a little extra harder to get you up to speed. Just kidding. We're living in contentious times, and there's much tension in culture, much tension in the world. We talked a little bit about the cancel culture that we're living in. And it can be difficult to live our beliefs as believers or as Christ followers. With that, coupled with the temptation that each and every one of us have to live for ourself, especially in a materialistic culture that we live in, to, to live for self, our desires that are selfish, instead of for Christ and his honor. And the Bible tells us that we were created for the glory of one. Our lives should live and breathe to give Jesus all the glory and every single thing that we do. But knowing at the same time, this tension that we all face is ongoing until Christ returns for his church. And so in this series, we're looking at ways that we can live for the glory of Jesus, for the glory of one, to honor God and his name, not ourself. Last week, we looked at Matthew chapter 10. And Jesus told his disciples not to be afraid, not to fear what others do, because truth always comes out. In other words, he was saying to have courage to not live in fear. And so don't be afraid because you are priceless to God. You matter to God. And again, the overall context of this chapter is Jesus was sending out the 12 disciples to minister. And he was giving them authority to drive out demons and to heal the sick. And Jesus gives the 12 specific instructions of what to do, where to go, and how to accomplish this mission. And here's what I want you to see, because Jesus said earlier in the chapter, in Matthew chapter 10, verses 16 through 20, I invite you to read with me. He says, I am sending you out like sheep among wolves. Therefore, be as shrewd as snakes and as innocent as doves. Be on your guard. You will be handed over to the local councils and be flogged in the synagogues. And on my account, you will be brought before governors and kings as witnesses to them and to the Gentiles. But when they arrest you, not if they arrest you, but when they arrest you, do not worry about what to say or how to say it. At that time, you will be given what to say, for it will not be you speaking, but the spirit of your father speaking through you. Now, we know here that Jesus is talking to his 12. He's giving them instructions. He's letting them know what they should be expecting. And he's saying, I'm sending you out as sheep among the wolves. Just think about that statement for a moment. Now, sheep don't necessarily go out and hang out where the wolves are at. They stay together as far away as from the predators, such as the wolves, because they know what's going to happen if the wolves get into the pack. Somebody's not going to have a good day. And so Jesus has given this illustration, and we know from Scripture that we're the sheep, and Jesus is the shepherd. And Jesus is telling his disciples, I'm sending you out among the wolves. In essence, Jesus is implying, he's saying, there's going to be more wolves than sheep because I'm sending you among them. There's going to be more of them than you. You're going to be among them. In other words, you're going to be in the world, but not of the world, like we talked about two Sundays ago. And he's reminding them that wolves like to attack, in essence. So you got to be aware. Now, I just want to make this side note. Jesus is so encouraging, isn't he? Come on now. I love reading the word of God and there's times in scriptures that he's talking and we're reading and it's going, wow, that's not easy to swallow, but you know, it's truth. And it's not for us again to live in fear, but to live in courage. 
because we overcome. But what he's talking about here in this passage is true for us. He sends us into the world as sheep to be light and truth. And in saying that, Jesus is not trying to alarm you. He's not trying to cause you to give in to fear, but he's trying to give us proper expectations as to what we can expect when we're among the wolves. Why? So that we can live for the glory of one in a proper way. And Jesus also encourages disciples and us that when we're in contentious or, or tense situations in life, that we're not alone. We don't have to worry about what to say or how to respond because Holy Spirit will speak through you. He helps us respond appropriately to make Jesus famous. And Jesus is really saying here, he's saying, I know that there's going to be tension and I know that the tension is going to be overwhelming for you, but you don't need to worry. Why do I say that? Well, Jesus said we need to be like a snake and a dove. And I don't know if there could be two more polar opposite creatures than a snake or a dove. Now, I had, just to let you know, I had the thought of what if I came out here today with a snake and a dove? Just to give you the comparison, and then I thought again about that, and I thought, no, I don't want to freak you out because I know some of you in the front would probably begin to move to the back. But yet Jesus gives us a visual of what to ponder of what our lives should be like as his followers. To be shrewd or wise as a snake. And we know that snakes are crafty. That's why we don't like them, right? They generally like to stay out of man's way as much as possible though because the snake lives in a world where it's hated by a deadly foe. And so it will try to preserve itself and that's why it gets out of the way. And Jesus was saying here in this passage to take a stand for him, to utilize wisdom in the world that we live in. He's saying, don't exercise zeal or passion without knowledge. You need both. He was saying, don't provoke a non-believer with the gospel where we can just try to force it on them because it's truth and because it's right. Jesus was saying also that to hold fast in your principles and who you are in Christ, who God has called you to be in him. But when the situation is hostile, don't force your beliefs in Christ onto someone else. He said, and is saying to us, wait for the spirit-led moment to share truth because he's going to give you what to say. Another characteristic of, of a snake would be this. A snake also glides quietly. It can hiss, but it doesn't do so very often. Why? Because it doesn't seek great publicity. It wants to remain hidden. It, remind, it, it wants to remain out of the way. And there are times when Holy Spirit opens up the door for us to share publicly for the crowd or for many to hear, but we must operate with wisdom to see and know the opportunity that the Lord is giving us. Not just abrasively firing our beliefs on everyone we come in contact with. And we've all seen those believers that are out there yelling and preaching, preaching the gospel in a way that seems like there's no love and that God is a God of hate. And that's not what the Lord has called us to. That's not what Jesus was telling us here. And so we must always operate in showing God's love to people. God's love is the message. It's not just in words, it's in action. It's in our demeanor. It's in our smile. The Lord uses that to break down barriers within people. And so Jesus is saying, we've always got to show his love, but we got to be wise how we do it. Be wise in how we share the truth of who Jesus is. And just like the snake who finds its way into small openings where others couldn't fit, if we can't get into people's hearts one way, then we must try another. You're tracking with me? 
If we can't get them to read the Bible, then we try to get them to hear it. If we cannot get them to hear a sermon, then we share a verse with them because it's still the word of God. And God can work in that one verse as much as he can work in and through a sermon. Share who Jesus is and your, share your story of what he's done for you. And I've said this before and I'll continue to say it. People can argue the word of God and they can debate it all they want, even though it is truth and the Lord will have the final say, but they cannot argue your testimony and your story of what Christ has done in you personally, how he saved you and the burden and the oppression of sin has left and he's given you a new life to live, you're forgiven, you're free in Christ. How the Lord has healed you in so many different ways, how he's provided for you in so many different ways. People cannot argue that. There's so much power in our testimony and story. There's a way into everyone's heart. So we've got to find it. We've got to be wise, just like a snake finds an opening. Jesus then also says for us to be innocent and gentle like doves. A dove is without a horn, a hoof, a fang, or any other means of defense. Meaning, the spiritual meaning for us is that we're not supposed to utilize weapons, both figuratively or literally, obviously. We also have laws against that, if you didn't know that, in our nation. Our defenselessness appears as a weakness, but it's really our strength. We're to be gentle and easily entreated. We're not to fly into passion because someone contradicts us. That's right. Because Jesus said there will be people that will contradict you. We shouldn't get angry because they hate us. Jesus calls us to endure the contradiction, the persecution, the slander, or whatever it is, with a tenderness and a gentleness as a dove bears all things. And I think it's not by accident that even when Jesus was baptized in water, that the Holy Spirit came in the form of a dove because he's gentle. And he won't force himself in our lives, but he will work. And when we open up to him, he has all power to change a life. We're also not to be driven into sin by the opposition. When they, we have pressure, peer pressure, or people that are forcing us trying to do something or to think like them because the dove is pure. Instead, we have to do good to all people and to glorify Jesus in all things and in all situations. And so Jesus is telling us to live in the tension between a snake and a dove. That's a pretty big tension if you think about it, two extremes. But that's what we're supposed to live as we rely on the Holy Spirit. We've got to be wise and shrewd and we have to be gentle and innocent as believers. And that applies to our actions, to our speech or our words, even including our social media posts. I love social media and I also hate social media. Because it can be positive, it can be uplifting, it can be encouraging, it can be a great resource for people. But it can also be destructive, it can tear down, and it's just full of debates. And we as believers have to guard ourselves from getting caught into that trap. Now, there's a time and a place for such things. Don't, don't, don't mistake what I'm saying. But if we're always living like that, what are we communicating to the world and to the people around us? The Apostle Paul also gives us similar instruction when we face opposition in Romans 16, 7 through 19. He says, I urge you, brothers and sisters, to watch out for those who cause divisions and put obstacles in your way that are contrary to the teaching you have learned. He says, keep away from them, for such people are not serving our Lord Christ, but their own appetites. By smooth talk and flattery, they deceive the minds of naive people. Everyone has heard about your obedience, so I rejoice because of you, but I want you to be wise about what is good and innocent about what is evil. 
So Paul's saying here that there's going to be those who would try to divide us as believers and to place obstacles in our way, whether individually or collectively as the body of Christ. Currently, we're seeing this woke agenda, even the Christian woke side of agenda, and cancel culture, etc. And there are things that are contrary to the word of God. And he says here, he warns us that there are those who operate like this are not following Jesus, but their own agenda. And they will use smooth talk and flattery to deceive. And let me tell you, the things that we're hearing, even in some of the woke agenda and cancel culture, a lot of it can sound good. And it sounds right. But when you get to the root of it, you see a different agenda. And we've got to live as wise stewards as shrewd as a snake to see that, to be aware, to know the God's word so that we're not taken off guard. And Paul says, stay away from these things and their teachings and to do so by understanding or being wise of what is good and innocent of what is evil. And so here's what Jesus and Paul are telling you and I. The first thing is to protect your mind and heart from evil. You've got to protect yourself. And the Lord will help you as you protect yourself. But the Lord gives us the responsibility to guard ourselves. We've got to be innocent of evil, misguard our mind and thoughts from evil things that tempt us into sin. Jeremiah 17, 9 says that our heart is deceitful. It will deceive us if we allow it to. Why? Because its fleshly desires can lead us into sin. We were all born with a flesh, with fleshly desires that wants to do the opposite of what God has called us to or how God has called us to live and rather than to live for ourselves instead of living for him. And that's why we need Jesus to be Lord over our heart and but also our mind. And the temptation, though, the battle begins in our mind. It begins with the thoughts. It's not sin when you're tempted. When the enemy tempts you, that's not the sin. The sin is when you begin to dwell on that thought or that temptation. And you let it ponder there and you think, well, maybe that wouldn't be so bad. Or we try to rationalize it. We try to justify it. And we allow that temptation or that thought to remain instead of taking it captive and making it obedient to Jesus. And at that point, when if we allow that to stay in there, at some point, we're drawing closer to that line of crossing the line into sin and making the choice of following through with that thought. That's when it becomes sin. And if we live in that pattern of sin by making that wrong choice, we've crossed the line and we don't deal with it, we don't repent of it, or maybe we even try to repent of it, but we keep going back to it and we don't get the help that we need. And it becomes a pattern of sin in our life. That's when it becomes destructive for the long haul. That's why it's so important to take every thought captive, as the Bible tells us. It's so important to guard our hearts and our minds like the word tells us. So we protect ourselves. We got to put on the full armor of God daily, as Paul says in Ephesians 6. And that's why Paul also says in 1 Corinthians 14, 20, he says, brothers and sisters, stop thinking like children. In regards to evil, be infants, be innocent of it. But in your thinking, be adults or be mature. Paul saying regarding evil or sin, have nothing to do with it. Be innocent of it. And to do that, our thinking has to mature. We've got to change the way we think. We've got to think a way God's word tells us to think, to have his perspective, to ask Holy Spirit to put on the mind of Christ daily, that we would think the way Jesus would think and that he wants us to think. And we need God's word to change our minds so that our lives follow suit. Moving on, second, get out of the way from all sin and ungodliness. Just like we talked about the snake gets out of the way of its foe, 
We must get out of the way of sin and those who tempt us to sin and ungodliness. In the Garden of Eden, when Satan tempted Eve, who then gave the fruit to her husband Adam, Satan said this in Genesis 3, 5. He said, for God knows that when you eat from that fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Eating from the tree of good and evil was not only sin, but it caused Adam and Eve to rely on self-rule and to assume independence apart from God. They were in essence saying, God, I, don't, I no longer need you. My eyes are open to good and evil. And that's why God did not want them to eat of the fruit. And God told them, we know this in scripture, God told them not to eat of the fruit. And the reason is, is because God knew that humanity could not handle good and evil on their own because they needed him. God intended for us to live in a perfect relationship with him apart from any sin. Everything was supposed to be good from the beginning. And we know how the story ends. We know how the Bible ends at one day, the Lord will get his way where we no longer will be faced with temptation and sin for all of eternity. But those who have confessed Christ, those who have put their faith in Jesus and are living for him will finally live in that perfect harmony with the Lord for all of eternity. Come on. God is so good and he's so faithful. But he knew that we couldn't handle the knowledge of good and evil on our own that we needed to depend on our creator for everything. And nothing's changed. He's made a way through Christ, and so we need to depend on him for everything, every single day of our life. And so when it comes to sin and ungodliness, make no mistake that they, the two of these things mess up our life from the inside out. And that's why we need Jesus. That's why we need to get out of the way and stay out of the way from all sin and ungodliness. With this, we must remember that Continually being exposed to the enemy's ways leads many away from faith and obedience to Jesus. When you and I think that we can handle the temptation or we place ourselves in situations where Satan can tempt us because we're not being wise about what is good and being innocent about what is evil, we're that much closer to giving in to sin. It's one thing to be innocently exposed to evil. It's another thing to intentionally be exposed to evil ongoing. There's a difference. And the Bible is clear when Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, 33, he says, do not be misled or make no mistake because bad company corrupts good character. It matters who we hang out with and who we do life with. It matters if it's they're helping us to draw closer to Jesus or to live for ourselves in a worldly way. In the movie Renaissance Man, there's a quote from actor Danny DeVito where he says, the choices that we make dictate the lives that we lead. That is a truth statement. That's in essence what the Bible tells us. That we've been given a free will. The Lord has given us the gift of free will. And make no mistake, it is a gift. God loves you so much that he's not going to force you into a relationship with him. Because that's not true love. If someone else here on earth were to try to force you in a relationship with him, that's not love. That's a coercion. That's manipulation. But God's done everything he possibly can do to show you how much he loves you by sending his one and only son, Jesus. We know that as believers. And he's given us the gift of free will to make choices all along the way. We can either make good choices that lead and multiply to other good choices, or we can make one bad choice which leads and multiplies to other bad choices. But all of our choices every single day that we live as a believer is either drawing us closer to Christ or it's pushing us further away. There is no middle ground. Our choices dictate the lives we lead. If you wanna live in victory, and the freedom in Christ that he came to bring, 
then we've got to make choices according to God's word that line up with that lifestyle. And when we do, I promise you, according to God's word, not because of my word and the way it says and the way I think, but because of what God's word says, when we do make those choices, our life begins to change and line up with living the victorious life. It doesn't mean we don't have problems ever because we're going to have problems. It just means that we overcome the problems because our perspective has changed because it's not about our problems any longer. It's about Christ in us. It's about Jesus living on the inside. We're alive and we're forgiven. We're living in the freedom of who he is and we overcome every problem, every trial, every situation, every need we face, no matter what it is, that's who our God is living on the inside of us. But it starts with one choice. And every day we have a choice when we wake up. It's another opportunity. The Bible says God's mercies are new every morning. He gives you his mercies to make the right choice, to make the right choices. The choices we make dictate the lives we lead. What kind of life do you want to live? The choice is yours. That's why we must protect our faith. We must protect our obedience to Jesus by choosing to be wise as a snake and gentle as a dove when it comes to the good versus the sin and ungodliness. With this, we must speak the truth in love. God calls us to speak truth into lives and situations ongoing, meaning all the time. There are opportunities, divine appointments that the Lord will orchestrate for us, that we get to speak truth into people and what they're going through. But we must, we must, we have to do it with love. We can't do it in hate or anger or ulterior motives because that would be ungodly. In Ephesians 4, Paul says the fivefold ministry of apostles Prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers equip the local church to serve Jesus through serving in ministry. You're called to serve in ministry within God's kingdom someplace. Not just a few of us, but all of us, according to scripture. And the purpose is this, because he says in there so that we would continually grow and mature in the Lord and not be swayed by ungodly teaching and deceitful scheming that is in the world around us. And he goes on to say in Ephesians 4.15, he says, instead, speaking the truth in love, we will grow to become in every respect the mature body of Christ who is the head, that is Christ. So Paul's telling us here in love to do this, but the Lord wants you and I to speak the truth in love at all times. We speak the truth in love, both out of our love for God and who he is, because we love him enough to be bold and to be obedient to what he's called us to, but we're gonna speak the truth. But also for our love for people. We've gotta love people the way God loves people. We've gotta see people the way God sees them. That he gave everything for them. They may be on the furthest path from him today, but it doesn't mean that he's not chasing them down, that he's not hunting them down, trying to communicate his love in different ways through different people, through different believers who have his face, through different people who have God's motive to say, who's gonna tell them? God sent me. God use me. Use the people... Use the situations in the workplace, God, to open up a door where I can speak truth to my coworkers or my family, my friends, my neighbors, whomever the Lord sends your way. We make Jesus famous when we don't hide the truth, but we share it with the world in love. The world needs to see who Jesus is more than ever before. They need to hear who Jesus is because Jesus is truth and he will change their lives. And so we grow and mature and we help others to grow and mature in the Lord when we speak the truth in love is what Paul is saying. We point out truth in God's timing. That's so important. We point out truth in God's timing because Holy Spirit will line up the divine appointments like Jesus told his disciples 
Don't be afraid of what to say because the Holy Spirit is going to give you the words at the right time. And he will do the same for us so that we can show what's right and what's wrong in love. But our motive and our focus, again, is to do it in God's love. Moving on, Paul speaks to the church in Colossus by instructing them in chapter four, verses two through six. He says, devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful and thankful. And pray for us too that God may open up a door for our message so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ for which I am in chains. Pray that I may proclaim it clearly as I should. Be wise in the way you act towards outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. And so Paul here shows us how to live in wisdom and in innocence as a dove. First, he says, guard your life through prayer while living alert with a thankful heart is another way to say it. The meaning of devoting yourself to prayer is to continue steadily or to persevere in prayer. Now, sometimes we can get into prayer and it's like we struggle to pray. But the Lord's word And there's moments where we may struggle to pray, but we've got to persevere in those moments to pray. It also means to have a strong determination or passion for prayer. If you don't enjoy prayer or you don't pray very much or very often, I want to challenge you to start asking the Holy Spirit to give you a hunger for prayer. Because I promise you, if you begin to ask that earnestly or with a right heart and a right motive, he's going to give you the hunger for prayer, a passion for prayer. And the reason is, is just because prayer accomplishes so many things, but one of the things that it accomplishes is that it guards our mind, it guards our heart, it guards our life from the temptations and the evilness of sin that we all face. And as we pray diligently, we've got to be alert or watchful as to what keeps us from prayer. I don't know about you, but... Maybe I'm the only one where I can go to sit down and pray or to kneel and pray or whatever before the Lord laying down on the floor and all of a sudden my mind begins to wonder about all these other things I have to do. Am I the only one? Okay, good. I was thinking I was a a special person. But I've learned how to take notes in that moment. It's okay to have a notebook or on my phone, I'll just... I'll take a note. This is what I have to do. All right, but I'm coming back to you, Lord. Or I'll turn my phone completely off, get away from all the digital notifications, everything, so I can just focus on the Lord. And I'll I'll make a handwritten note on a piece of paper. But we've got to be alert and watchful of what will try to keep us. The enemy always brings those thoughts to our minds at that moment for a reason. He's being sneaky like a snake. So we've got to outwit him with the Lord's help. And so we've got to also use wisdom to be alert of the temptations to sin that the enemy will try to bring us. We all have those hot buttons in our life of temptations. We all have them. If you say you don't, you're a liar. We all have them because we're all human. And the Bible talks about that. And so we have to be aware of our hot buttons where we got to guard ourselves, got our mind, guard our hearts, have accountability people, believers that we can be accountable to if we really struggle in a certain area. But we've got to be alert because the enemy will try to come in and is sneaky and he doesn't create any new way to come in. He comes in with his old ways. He may find somebody different, but he, it's the same way. So we've got to guard ourselves and be alert. And with that, we've got to possess a thankful heart of gratitude towards Jesus and what he's done for us. Why? Because living with a thankful heart protects our heart and life from the lies and the deceit of the enemy. When we're thankful and we are acknowledging the Lord for who he is and what he's done ongoing in our life every single day, we will see the enemy coming from a mile away. Because we know who he is and we know what he's done. The Lord has been so good. So I'm not going to give into that. Second, we must look for the open door to proclaim truth. As we pray with a watchful and thankful heart, the Lord always gives us open doors of opportunities 
to escape temptation, the Bible says, but in the other situations, he gives us opportunities to share truth at the right time with somebody who needs to hear it. Always. The Holy Spirit gives us divine appointments to make Jesus famous by sharing God's love and truth. It's so powerful. It's so awesome to serve the God that is, we think we've got our, our day mapped out. And we do. But the Lord divinely orchestrates our day for his purposes. If we're being alert and in tune with the Spirit, Holy Spirit, to lead us and guide us in those moments. And so we've got to look for these op open opportunities because they're awaiting for us to walk through to deliver truth. You never know the impact that you're going to have on somebody else by your obedience to the Lord and responding to his leading, his voice, and by sharing God's love, maybe your story, your testimony, truth of who Jesus is in a certain moment. It's not because of you. It's not because of me. It's because of the God we serve. He's so faithful in that. And Paul goes on to say, then also live discreetly in your behavior. Paul says, be wise in the way that you act towards outsiders. In other words, we've got to be self-aware of our actions and how we come across to those who don't know Jesus because they're watching us. Don't forget that people are watching you at all times, including our social media posts. And so we need to be wise as a snake in how we act and at the same time, gentle and innocent as a dove. And when we're intentional with our behavior, others will see Jesus in us and they will be drawn to him. Paul also says, be diligent in serving God's purposes, which also means to make the most of every opportunity when we're wise. Make the most of every opportunity that the Lord gives you. Step out in faith because we're living for the glory of one. We're living to make Jesus famous, so we're faithful in what he's called us to do. We're living in wisdom. And to say it this way, we will be faithful or diligent in every moment and every season to see the God opportunities that lay before us to make Jesus famous. We'll live in courage, not in fear, to speak boldly about Jesus. And so make the most of every opportunity. And Paul then tells us that winsome and wholesome speech attracts others to Christ. He says, let all your conversations be full of grace. Be gracious in your conversations. Let it be seasoned with salt so that you may know how to answer everyone. As believers, our speech must be pleasant, encouraging, kind, and gracious. In other words, conversations that are worthy of being identified with Christ. Our words and speech should set an example of godliness and decency for all who hear, always speaking the truth in love. In other words, our speech should draw others to Christ. It should make him famous. People should hear us and go, wow, what you just said was amazing. It changed me. It, it struck a chord with me. There's something different about you. It's to open up the conversation that they can ask questions because God is searching for them. He's going after them. And a conversation that is seasoned with salt is the one that is right for the occasion or the moment, that is wholesome or marked with purity. Like salt, but in a spiritual sense, our conversations should enhance and add flavor to one's life, causing others to thirst and hunger for Jesus. We don't have to get out and beat people over the head with the Bible. If we would just love people the way God loves them and begin a normal conversation by saying, hi, this is who I am. Who are you? Where do you live? Do you have family? Where do you work? What do you do? We were just talking about this week with a, couple, a few men from Propel. If we would just live like that, how many opportunities will the Lord open up for us to share the gospel and our testimony? You don't know how many people that you could lead to Christ. 
Think about that. The impact that you can have on eternity and God's kingdom. That's what he's called us to. Let our conversations be seasoned with salt, causing others to thirst and hunger for Jesus. And at the other moments in time, other situations, our speech needs to be graceful, but they, it may need to use the use of stern words in love, in love when necessary to challenge and oppose the enemies of Christ. But in those moments, don't worry, Jesus said, because the Holy Spirit's going to give you the words what to say. Another aspect of our lives and speech in Philippians chapter 2, verses 14 through 16a, he says, do everything without grumbling or arguing. Silence in here. Cricket, cricket, cricket. So that you may become blameless and pure, children of God without fault in a warped and crooked generation. Then what? You will shine among them like stars in the sky as you hold firmly to the word of life. Here's the point, church, and we've got to get a hold of this and make sure we're living in a proper way here. Complaining and arguing turns people away from Jesus. If we as believers are always complaining, if we're arguing amongst one another or we're picking arguments with people in the world all the time, it will turn people away to Jesus, from Jesus rather than drawing them to him. That's what Paul's telling us here. And when the world sees and hears believers complain and argue with one another, including on social media, like you've already talked about, people don't want to open up their hearts to the gospel. Why would they? Because the world is arguing. The world is complaining. How are we, how are we being the salt and the light? How are we being different or living different if we're doing the same things that the world's doing? It matters. Your actions, my actions matter. Our behavior matters. Our words matter. The conversations we have matters in the kingdom of God. And so we're called to live lives that are free of grumbling and arguing. Why? Because these will detract, detain, and detour us from what God has for us and from us making Jesus famous. Instead, when we live with thankful hearts and strive to live in peace with everyone, we mature in the Lord in a culture and world that is evil. And people will see our life like a shining star, he says. Bright, there's no mistaking. There's something different about us when we're living this way. And they will be drawn to Jesus. In closing, here's what Paul reminds us in Ephesians chapter 5, verses 15 through 20. He says, be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days are what? Evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another with psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit. Sing and make music from your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. When it comes to living wise as a snake and gentle or innocent as a dove, we must know God's will for your life. You have to know God's will for your life and then walk cautiously in wisdom. Each of us must know God's will for our life, what we were created for. Now, obviously, as the body of Christ, our mission is the great commission in Matthew 28 that Jesus told us. But we also need to know what our individual mission from God is. And you have an individual mission and purpose that you were created to accomplish while you're here on earth. We all have a personal mission. For me, God called me to be a pastor. That means I have to live as a wise and obedient servant of the Lord, as be, to be self-aware of what the Lord wants to do, what's going on in culture, what the enemy wants to do, so that I can live not only in the wisdom, but as the innocence as a dove. I can live cautiously at all times because the enemy wants to trip me up just like he wants to trip you up. 
And the same is for all of us. You have a, a calling from God. You have a mission from God personally that he wants you to accomplish while you're here on earth. And you must live wise and cautiously always so the enemy does not get a foothold or trip you up in any way. And that's why Paul goes on to say here that we must live by the Spirit. We've got to be filled with the Spirit. And the meaning there in that context in the Greek is it's not a one-time experience of being filled with the Spirit. It's a continually, continual way of life, repeatedly being filled with God's Spirit every single day is what the meaning of that passage. So that means every day I got to get up, I got to live and be filled with the Spirit. What does that look like? That means I have to die to my flesh every single day. I have to pick up my cross like Jesus said, and I have to follow him. I make that choice. It's my choice. The Lord can't choose it for me. I have to make that choice. And out of that one choice daily, it dictates how I live. It dictates all the other choices. It dictates when the temptations come. It tells me how I'm going to live for that day. I'm going to be filled with the Spirit today. Holy Spirit, not my will, but your will in me today. Have your way in me personally. Have your way in my marriage. Lord, help me to be the husband that you've called me to be. Help me to be the father that you've called me to be. Lord, help me to be the pastor. Give me your wisdom. What do you want to do and propel? Lord, help me to see because you already know and you already have a plan, but Lord, I'm just your shepherd. I'm your under shepherd, Jesus. You're the great shepherd. I'm just here to accomplish what you want to do and propel. So, Lord, have your way in me so that I get out of the way because this is all about you. You see, if every one of us, whatever you're called to individually and personally, if we would live like that, our lives would change. Our lives, we would continue to grow and mature. And we would see a greater fruit of what God wants to do in you and through you. That's how good God is. The last point is this, is that allow Holy Spirit to transform every area of your life, including your relationships and your life of worship to God. In other words, like Paul was saying here, don't live like the world does. It comes down to choices. Don't be drunk on alcohol. Don't be high on drugs. Don't be tempted to do all and what else that the world has to offer that will lead us to worldly living? But we've got to continue to be filled and led by the Holy Spirit so that our lives are truly transformed every single day. That your relationships are transformed. And your relationship and worship of Jesus is continually growing and strong. We've got to draw close to Jesus. And our choices dictate whether we will do that or not. This is how we live wise as a snake and innocent and gentle as a dove. Because that's what will impact the world around us. That's what will draw others to Jesus. And that's what will make Jesus famous in us and through us in the world around us. Amen?